I'm paired uh, with Duncan Lockerbie of um, Orkney, who um, is uh, both a publisher of New Arcadian Voices, and before that was very much involved in uh, really central Scottish uh, voices with, with publishing. But Duncan also runs a cheese shop called Delicatessen in the heart of Orkney in Kirkwall. And our trouble has been that with Duncan's schedule in the cheese shop and my <laughs> schedule in the summer, of stravading out over blanket walks and things in countries, some of which Kirsty knows well. Um, in contrast to what people were saying about all oh, these days, you know, we can just swap emails and stuff. But what I'm going to write, which, uh, read rather, which is just a little extract of some of what is in progress, is actually the reverse. So I was genuinely spending days and end, which was delicious, in some places where there is no signal, and that's I mean, there's not phone signal even, you lose it. And email, well, you know, what's that sort of thing? Um, part of what was intriguing me about that was um, just that situation to be in in the 21st century, so exploring that. And also Duncan and myself both inhabiting slightly different parts of northern Scotland, but as some of you know, I've also, including through it northwards now, got an interest in the wider concept of North, both in Scotland and across the Northern Hemisphere, as both a physical space is changing very rapidly at the moment through ice melt, it's changing absolutely, um, but also as an imagined space that has tickled my imagination since I was first reading really, so I, I can't remember a time when I wasn't intrigued by concepts of North either within Scotland or beyond, whether it was north of where I lived in uh, Glasgow, thinking about the Cairn Gorms as a place that I'd never been to, and I drew a circle around um, the Cairn Gorms in my primary school atlas, to, um, and I had an imagination of what was there through beyond that coming across the work of people like Barry Lopez, for example, who then, more than any other writer actually, although Edward Hopeland would be part of that as well, was influencing some of my concepts of what that North would be. And then also now, as somebody who's aware of nature, environment, ecological change, knowing that we're going through um, a time of uh, really rapid uh, change there. So how does that change our perceptions of this North? Because we have an anchoring. And North, actually, in a compass direction, seems to be one of those terms that actually leads your mind to certain images um, which may have basis in some kind of reality but I'm also intrigued by just the imagination of that and I forget his name now but there's um, an artist uh, based in Pitnawin who does that deliciously in some of his visual art. That's not there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, and I love the way that he um, imagines, um, for example, Arctic expeditions that are purely in his imagination and almost documents them right down to some of the um, materials, some of the physical objects that might have been in that ex expedition and then realises that in, in the paintings. So that's part of what's going on, but I'll just give you a flavour because then this is from me rather than Duncan because uh, as you hear from this, um, we really have actually had uh, quite a lot of difficulty communicating. So the imagined space between us is actually quite large, which maybe I, I think we're turning to, I hope can be turned to advantage in this situation that we're in. So this is from uh, just basically something part, part uh, elements of essay and part from uh, initial correspondence. And the other thing that struck me about this actually, because part of this goes into a blanket <coughs> is that um, I don't know how many of you have tried to move through blanket bulk, which is basically patterned, well, in the north of Scotland, in flow type areas, is patterned pool systems with very shaky moss in between, so if you're wanting to go from there to there in a blanket bulk, you have to go maybe there, and maybe there, and over there, and maybe back a bit, and then change your mind, and then go there. So actually, it struck me today, thinking of it, hearing what some people were saying about SE form, that actually trying to move through a blanket bulk isn't a million miles from an SE. 
and it also links into what Chris knows even better than I do and writes beautifully about, which is that going through Blanket Bog or anywhere with an eye for the wildlife that might be there, whether it's the birds, whether it's the plants, etc., whether it's under your feet, whether it's over your head, it's also, and I don't want to be too kind of um, Victorian, just some stories about this, but there's something about going out into the wild, and that could be the wild on your doorstep, let alone the remote stuff, which is also a kind of essay experience because. Uh, I think, Chris, well, with you, you might not agree, but I'm pretty sure you're right and you would agree that part of the beauty or part of the joy of that, part of the addiction to it, if you like, is the element of surprise. So, yes, you've gone from a starting point and saying, right, I'm today starting to try and walk through a blanket block or a forest or something like that. So, that's your decision. But you have no guarantee what is going to happen in the next hour, or two hours, however long you're there. You're actually there because you want to be surprised by the things that come up that you did not predict. And um, that to me again seems kind of essay like, embodied essay like, if you like. So there's elements of that in this, and I won't keep you for too long, but I'll just read you uh, a little bit because there's a gap in it, but uh, you'll get that. So this is me being in correspondence with Duncan, but also working something a bit more. At first glance, part of the reason it's been hard for us to communicate much seems simple, not spots. During chunks of the spring and summer, I've been working in some of the most trackless country I know. One of a team surveying birds, mammals and vegetation in the wilds of North Sutherland. I've often been far from both roads and reliable phone signals. Your schedule and mine have meant that there seemed to have been few days or hours when we could have a chance to chat. So my hiking along a mountain slope or venturing into the boglands just adds to the difficulty at a time when we might otherwise have spoken. Like that day when I was inland from Loch Erebol, going towards Foynevan in a day of sunshine and wader calls, when the signal evaporated faster than the dew on the deer grass. We'd managed a quick phone rendezvous mid-morning and I suggested that we could speak later before you needed to go to the shop. Duncan would say runs the shop in purple. Seemed simple and a good way to converse while I paused for some thermos coffee, but long before the appointed talk time, I'd entered the valleys and crags of no speak. So I'll tell you a little of what happened while we failed to converse, what I saw and some of what I didn't see. There were pools along the bog mosses when I reached a high plateau. I could see the Bentland Firth a few miles off and a blue-grey smudge on the horizon that I took to be the hills of Hoy. Orkney. Laser flashes might have made a connection between us right then, but signalling in Morse would have defeated me, while well, you, of course, were in Kirkwall, not Orkney. So my attention soon shifted to the closer sight and sound of a greenshack flying a couple of hundred metres away. Then another veered in from the east, diving at the first bird and chasing it fast and low over the bog and beyond. Once it had seen off the intruder, the second bird returned. Rising of a sky mirroring lochens, it began to call and call. The notes fluted loud and softer and louder with shifts of breeze. I kept it in view as it ascended, cricking my neck back to watch, then arching further to catch its shape and binoculars and hold the silhouette in focus. After more than a minute, it stalled its high rise and plummeted steep and fast to reach the ground in seconds. In times when I've thought of it since, I know that my interpretation of what it's doing in that airspace could be wrong. That the green shank's communication and signalling is not my language, though I think I understand some of it. That its place is not my home, much though I relish going there. And though my image of your home, Isles, is more, much more than that smudge on the northeast horizon, Duncan, I've visited many times over many decades. Still, I wonder how much I know of Orkney and the wider north. How much I'm projecting my own preconceptions on the screen of the cool blue horizon. I know some of the things that would have been in my mind about Orkney before the green shout made me turn away. From memory, these didn't include any cruise liners, he's talking about that, or wine, no local Orkney food and no reckoning of time other than the hours of that day. Now, the 160 years of your family business routes 
make me think of some of my own family connections to the north. But I'll leave that for later as we see what place our name takes us further along the terms of this conversation.